I know last week I talked about telling the story. I'm following it up this week with talking about evangelism with purpose. Um, if you look at Jesus' ministry in his telling of the good news, he had purpose. There was a reason he did everything in his ministry. It had purpose. And I think that sometimes we, we can lose that a little bit, and I think it's good for us to reflect on. One of the most difficult people to work with in this world is one that has no purpose in life. They have no purpose for living. I don't know if you've had to work with someone like that, but it is difficult. There's a truism that says, aim for nothing and you'll hit it every time with amazing accuracy. That goal is 100% attainable with ease. People without purpose have no reason to live or to do anything or to be anything. On the other hand, a person who has purpose in their life is almost undefeatable or at least unstoppable. Many people have tried to stop a driven person without success. And that should be the Christian drive. That should be the Christian person. The reason being, they have, you have everything to live for. Norman Vincent Peale once said, shoot for the moon. If you miss your target, you will still be among the stars. And it's true. There's some truth to that. People with purpose usually succeed at what they take on, whether they hit their goal or not. Evangelism um, is like that. Jesus gives us all Christians a great commission in Matthew 28. He says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I know we've all read that. We all understand that passage, perhaps. Probably I've read it over a thousand times. And yet, there are so many people that just look over that and don't pay much attention to it. I've asked myself, why? Why is it a part? Why is, if it is a part of Christian life, why are so many Christians apathetic toward evangelism? So many Christians are indifferent to the lost. The state of the lost caused them no alarm. It should cause us alarm. Perhaps it's because we're so busy in our lives that the lost seems not to be of any concern to us. They're perishing in their sin, but personal business keeps us from sharing Jesus with them. Perhaps it's because we just don't care. We see them, we don't even recognize them as lost. We're not looking at them through the eyes of God. Then I thought, more than likely, the reason for this indifference is because our purpose in this life is not God's purpose for us in this life. Perhaps we've conflicting purposes with God. We've not been focused on God's mission or his purpose for our lives. The Lord's mission was to seek and save the lost. That's it. That was his mission. And so this morning, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 to 9, and see what we can learn about evangelism through the teaching and, and the example of the Apostle Paul. Whenever Paul went, wherever, sorry, Paul went, he observed people. Most recognizing their lost state. Paul was taken to the city of Athens from Berea because of the Jews that were persecuting him and other Christians. And while Paul is waiting in Athens for Silas and Timothy, what do you find him doing? Just sitting on his thumbs waiting for them? No, he's observing the people of Athens and the city was full of idols, meaning there was idolatry being practiced by the people everywhere. And it drove him to open his mouth and to reason with the people there, particularly the Jews in the synagogue, but also the Gentiles in the marketplace. 
Paul did what he did because he was looking at what was going on around him. He was focused on other people, not himself and his business. He was looking, well, it was kind of his business, I guess, but he was looking and seeing their lost state, and, and it drove Paul to action. Paul had been flogged, beaten, stoned, left for dead, persecuted all the time, shipwrecked, in danger, robbers, gone without eating, and much more, because he longed to share the gospel, the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. He had a tremendous desire to get back to the churches in Corinth and spend some time with them. They were always on his heart. But there was work to be done in Ephesus, which is where he currently was. And he recognizes several things about Ephesus. As he observes the city of Ephesus, he realizes that there is a great opportunity there for the gospel and a great need to preach the gospel. And so he stuck around for three years, twice as long as he stayed anywhere else in his travels and in his mission work. And Paul tells us why he stayed so long. He saw that God had opened a door of opportunity. He saw Ephesus as an opportunity for the preaching of the gospel. Ephesus was the kind of city where God-fearing Christians would not want to live. In the U.S., you have, if you had your choice as a Christian where to live, you probably wouldn't pick New Orleans. Now, it's not that much worse than other places, but it has some things that are, make it obviously very anti-Christian. And I, I, I think that none of us would really choose to live there. That is the kind of city Ephesus was. Money was to be had everywhere, a bustling financial and commercial center. It was also the home of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Get this, none other than the temple of the goddess of fertility, Diana. Along with that came all sorts of idolatry, idolatry, immorality, legalized prostitution. People believed in magic. They were very superstitious. They were always looking for fortune tellers and soothsayers to guide their lives. It was a city that was full of evil practices, a city that lived wickedly, just like Sodom and Gomorrah a melting pot of worldliness where none other in its day except for maybe Corinth would match it. Have you ever noticed that there are two kinds of people in this world when it comes to these kinds of situations? The pessimist sees the problem in every situation and the optimist sees the opportunity in every situation. Paul was a Christian. He was an optimist. He looked at the problems in the city and he saw the lostness of the people and he decided this was a really good opportunity to preach the gospel. I mean, who else needed it more than they did? People needed to hear about Jesus. People need to change their lives. So much so that Paul and his co-workers for the Lord turned that city upside down. They had already done that with the gospel in other places like Thessalonica, and now they do it in Ephesus. I mean, they got that city on its ear. You know, people, it's no different today for us. It is absolutely no different. As you walk through our communities, and you can see the great need for Jesus, for the good news in people's lives. You can see the thousands of lives that need changing, that need to hear the truth about Jesus and his saving grace. You and I need to be the Paul of yesterday today and, and have that desire, have that optimism to see it as an opportunity and have the desire to give it to the people. You know, Jesus, looking at the crowd, said, the fields are ripe unto harvest. That's how we should look at it. <coughs> do we see our community as ripe unto harvest? Or do we just see it as, ah, it's just a bunch of people out there. They're having fun. How do you look at it? The book of Isaiah begins with the account of the wickedness of Judah. And it goes on to tell about the judgment that is to come on them for their faithlessness to God. 
God reminds them of his faithfulness to them and warns the wicked again. And then comes the vision that Isaiah receives from God. When Isaiah sees the vision, he proclaims his lostness before God, his unclean lips amongst the people of unclean lips, and a seraphim comes with burning coals and touches his lips, and his guilt is taken away, his sins are atoned for, they're taken away. Then he hears the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah's response, and I don't see this as him sitting there and thinking, well, maybe, maybe I should go. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. what." He just goes, here I am. Send me. That's how we should be. That is how we all should feel in response to the gospel. We have a we have the gospel of Christ, the best thing. <laughs> this is really annoying. We have the best thing that anybody can have and that, any, and that everybody needs. And we can show them that they can have atonement for their sin. We have an obligation to share Jesus with the lost. Just like Paul, Paul felt that obligation. He didn't hang on to the gospel like it was something that was his and no one else needed it or wanted it. He knew it was to be preached to all. It was to be shared with everyone. Amy Carmichael tells of a dream she had where there is this clearing in a jungle that people were walking across towards a terrible precipice, a cliff high above a valley far below. A mother with a little girl clinging to her skirt walked over the cliff and no one warned her. The little boy followed and she could hear their screams as they fell to their death. Then there were multitudes of people doing the same thing. She cried in her dream and kept saying, why isn't anybody telling them or warning them about the danger that's before them? That's what you're doing when you don't share Jesus with someone that needs to hear about Jesus. You're letting them walk over that cliff to their death. You see, when we don't share the good news, we're not allowing them to have the opportunity to turn. We're just allowing them to perish. As Christians, we have the obligation to warn the lost of their impending doom. Now beware when you make this commitment. Jesus said, count the cost. And he said that for good reason. You will notice that Paul mentions something else about evangelism in verse 9 that scares the daylights out of most people who claim to be Christians. And with good reason. You and I don't like to be rejected or to be made fun of or put down or have people whisper foolish things behind our backs. We don't like confrontation. Well, some of us don't. Or to face adversity of any kind that make us, might make us feel bad or harm us. Paul says in verse 9 that he also faced many adversaries. People, there were always, there will always be fierce opposition in this world to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine in Ephesus people who turned to Christ getting rid of the idols and no longer purchasing them? That affected the bottom line of a man called Demetrius. His business suffered because of the gospel. And he suffered so that he wasn't going to take it lying down. He, he talked about the physical and emotional abuse that Paul went, or sorry, we talk about the physical and emotional abuse that Paul went through in his life because of his obligation to take an advantage of the opportunities afforded to him by God. Jesus has adversaries and his missionaries have the same adversaries. Jesus also tells us that he has overcome all of those things. And now in him, we also overcome those things. So don't stress about them. Don't worry about them. It's just a, a phase. Today we have many adversaries. May not look quite like they did in Paul's day, but we have adversaries to the gospel. I've been labeled a fanatic at times because I hold to the gospel, or I'm using Christianity as a crutch. 
Hmm. That's interesting. I've not. I threw the only pair of crutches I ever had in my life because I broke my leg. I threw in the corner and walked on the broken leg. So I don't need a crutch that way, I don't think. <laughs> but um, I've been labeled, had that. I'm a Bible thumper, a homophobe. And you just, I mean, you've all heard them all. You're called that too, probably. All of us are because we believe in Christ. We put our faith in Christ. Um, I've been sworn at, rejected, called names, mocked. I mean, it just goes on and on. So, so was Paul, so was Jesus. I guess you could say I'm in good company. And when it happens to you, you're in good company. The government and lawmakers of our time are caught up in wickedness, seeing by their own wisdom to make things the way they would like them to be. Now, understand this. It's nothing new. Like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. But they think it's new, and they think they're brilliant. And you just look back in history, and all they're doing is repeating history. Foolishly. They pass laws making evil good and good evil, but God's warned them in Isaiah 5.20 when he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those. That's not a good thing. And yet we see and hear people doing that. We have Hollywood depicting evil as good and good as evil. And they claim to set the standard for what life really is about on this earth. Not really. But we don't have to look that far into the world to see our adversaries. There are those who claim to be Christians that are also adversaries. Those who say they love Jesus and accept worldly beliefs and standards and oppose those who are Christians. The Jews did the same thing with their people. How can you live for Christ and support Things like homosexuality and immorality and idolatry. How can you support those things? How can you be those things? The lukewarm Christian doesn't want to make waves or cause trouble or be mean to anyone or offend anyone. Let me tell you something. Jesus offended a lot of people because the truth offends those who don't want to hear the truth. And that's just the way it is. So expect opposition when you're out there sharing the gospel. But don't stop sharing the gospel. Because that's what Jesus says we're to do. Don't let the world stop us from doing what Jesus wants us to do. First, observe the lost. Realize that those people are without Christ. That they are slowly and aimlessly sorry, marching to the cliff an impending doom. They will die outside the blessings of Christ until we realize that we'll never be motivated to do anything about it. If we believe everyone is okay, then what's the point? Because everyone's not okay. We should see that. We should look at these people through the eyes of God. And we should see people as opportunities. It's easy to jump on someone for an ungodly thing that they do. It's easy enough to point out and ridicule and all of those things. But what about looking at them as being duped? And how about looking at them as an opportunity to share the gospel so they can change and have the same blessings you have in Christ? Be the optimist instead of the pessimist and see the people God puts in your path as opportunity or as a field ripe unto harvest. Because that's the work we're called to. Understand our obligation. When you believe um, and you've confessed Jesus as Lord and repented and all of those things and immersed into him and you raise the newness of life, you're cleansed by the blood of Christ, you have signed up and made a commitment with your life to being a servant of Jesus Christ and spreading that good news. You are giving the great you are were given the great commission. I know you might be a little afraid, and, and some people might say, Well, I don't know if I can do it because I don't know if I know enough, and all of these things. And, and let me tell you, you all know enough. Because all you have to do is talk about the love of Jesus. And that he died on the cross for you. You know that, don't you? That that love 
for you, compelled them to that cross. He paid your sins. And now he wants you to be with him. How hard is that? You don't have to get into breaking down the genealogy and, and all of these different things. Just share the Lord with them. And understand that but there will be those who oppose you. One of the hardest things for Christians to accept is that there will be opposition to Christ in the gospel. I have seen people that go out, they're all on fire, and someone says, are you joking? That's just a human story. That's just a, a myth. And they're like, <gasps> and they don't know what to do. Don't be like that. Peter tells us, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within us. That is our purpose. That is our goal. That is our, that is our purpose statement for life. Spreading the good news of salvation to the world. Tell people about Jesus. Invite them to church. Tell them about outreach functions we're having. Be a good example in their life. Not just when you're in front of them, but be that good example all of your life, everywhere you are. And just be a Christian every day like Jesus has called us to. If we can help you with that or help you with your walk with Christ or if you want a walk with Christ or any of those things, let us know how we can help you while we stand and sing.